Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. God bless you, everyone. Welcome to Transforming Word Ministries Tuesday Night Bible Study. I am Apostle Marcos. Welcome all of you that are joining with us on and off of Facebook. Amen. And those of you that may be watching this uh, recording <clears throat> at a later time, welcome. <clears throat> Excuse me, please. Hallelujah. We're still in the middle of our series on the Gospel of John. Tonight we're completing John chapter 5 with healing part 2, picking up from where we left off last time. Let's get started and of course let us pray. Heavenly Father, hallelujah, we magnify your name, we glorify your name, and Father we welcome you here to join with us, Father, as we journey through your word. Father, we ask that you would shed your light, Father, upon your word and reveal things, Father, to those that are watching and to myself also that may be in excess and beyond, Father, what, the, what we're covering this evening. Give us revelation so that we may have understanding and we give you full sway tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Hallelujah. Well, where we left off last week, in part one, Jesus encountered a man in Bethesda, and this man had a 38-year-old condition that left him unable to move without help. And this condition sounds very much like what modern science calls muscular dystrophy which according to the Mayo Clinic is a group of diseases that damages muscles and causes very, uh, progressive weaknesses and loss of muscle mass. This is exactly the, the conditions that are described in, in scripture that this man was suffering from. Now most people with this condition of muscular dystrophy eventually need a wheelchair. Now, Jesus healed this man, but the legalistic mentality of the Jews focused on this man breaking the law by carrying his, his bed mat rather than on his miraculous healing. So let's turn to John chapter 5. We're going to pick up with verse 14. God bless you, Brother Cornell. Hallelujah. Welcome. John chapter 5, verse 14. Afterwards, Jesus findeth the now healed man in the temple and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. Now, Jesus stated that this disability that this man had that was manifested as weakness and a crippling inability to move had been the product of sin. Now in being physically healed, this man now had an outward change of appearance, but his perception was still like the world. This unclean spirit is a corrupt attitude and perspective that affects the way the infected person thinks, resulting in the type of negative behavior that the person then exhibits. And this is what led to his sin, which manifested in this physical disability. We have no idea what that sin was, and really that's none of our business. That's between him and God, amen? But now that he'd been healed, Jesus warns him to no longer sin or the consequences that he brings upon himself will be even worse than before. Hallelujah. Let's go to verse 15 and 16. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus which had made him whole. And therefore, or for this reason, did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him? And this tells us why. Because Jesus had done these things 
on the Sabbath day. So it, it didn't matter to them that Jesus miraculously healed this man. He did it in violation of the no work rule of the Sabbath. But from having read the scriptures of that event, we can see that Jesus did not work in healing this man. He just merely spoke to him. So this was really nothing, nothing but an excuse on the Jews part to persecute not only Jesus, but anyone that did anything that violated their perception of the law. And that was really just legalism. Let's continue verse 17 and 18. But Jesus answered, and these were the Pharisees, the religious leaders and the enforcers of obedience to the law of that day. Jesus answered them and said, my father worketh hitherto or to this moment, my father works on the Sabbath and I work. Therefore, the Jews sought to kill him. Why? Because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his father, making him equal with God. Now, in John chapter 19, verse 7, when Pontius Pilate refused to crucify Jesus, the Jews responded and said, we have a law and by our law, Jesus, this man ought to die because he made himself the son of God. So this statement was very prophetic in itself. The Jews never even realized it. According to the Mosaic law, an unblemished sacrifice had to be offered in order to atone for sin. And God knew that man was unable to pay that price for sin himself. So God manifested himself in human form as the man we know as Jesus. And literally he made himself the son of God. And what was the purpose of all of that? Scripture tells us, scripture interprets scripture. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, Jesus tells us the reason. He said, for this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Hallelujah. Now, Lucifer, because the devil is not his uh, given name, it's not a proper name, it describes how he operates along with Satan, and Lucifer operating in his nature as the devil, which means accuser or slanderer, Lucifer influences man to slander others and indulge in self-will. So to destroy the works of the devil is to destroy Lucifer's opportunity to accuse. God, having made himself into human form, already knew that the only way that the law's demand for death for sin could be satisfied was through the death of a pure sacrifice. That sacrifice had to be of sufficient status in order to be suitable for mankind. This tells us why animal sacrifices were only temporary because even though they were alive, even though they were unblemished, even though they were sin free, they were of an insufficient status to completely atone for the sin of mankind because mankind was of a higher ranking status, having been given dominion over animals and every living thing on the planet by God. So the sacrifice for man had to be of equal or greater status than mankind. Mm. 
in order to satisfy this, God would then manifest himself in human form and be that pure sacrifice that would willingly die in order to save humanity. Once the sacrifice was made, Lucifer would no longer have the legal grounds to accuse anyone of sin who believes the gospel and has been rendered in right standing with God, what scripture calls being justified. Now, in order to accomplish this, Christ humbled himself, making himself subject to the authority of death. He became a servant to man and he taught the principle of servanthood, which is serving others by making their needs a priority over our own. Paul said, let's turn to Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. Paul said, let this mind or this way of thinking be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the physical form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. In other words, Jesus didn't consider himself entitled to take advantage of his being equal with God. Verse 7, But, or instead, made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men or in human form. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Now let's go back to John chapter 5 verse 19. Then answered Jesus unto the Pharisees, Verily, verily, or truly, I tell you, the Son of Man can do nothing of himself. This tells us that Jesus does not exercise his own will. But what he seeth the Father do, and this word seeth is the Greek word blepo, and it's used as a metaphor meaning to see with the mind's eye or perceives. So what he sees the Father do, for what things soever the Father doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. Hmm. So this emphasizes the point that God the Father as a creator, conceives an idea or a thought, and that is, um, I don't want to say described, but it is basically the concept of, of the, the word, the Greek word logos, ideas, thoughts, and concepts, not physical form, but in spiritual form, but just as real. So the Father, as the Creator, conceives an idea, Logos. God the Son then embodies that Logos, or that idea, translating and communicating that idea through another Greek word, Rhema, which is the physical expression of Logos. And then the Holy Spirit performs it. So therefore, God the Son embodies what God the Father first conceives. And this doesn't mean that they're two separate beings, but rather two forms of the same being. One in the spiritual world, the other in the physical world. It's like the difference between having a dollar bill and four quarters two different forms of the same amount of money having equal value. But one is in paper form, the other is in metal form, but they're both equal in value. Mm. Hallelujah. Let's continue. Let's go on down to verse 20. Jesus said, 
for the father loveth the son. Now let's pause there for a moment because we would automatically assume that this word love here is the Greek word agape, which means unconditional love. But it's actually the Greek word phileo, which carries the idea of brotherly love, you know, being a friend, being fond of, having affection for or, or personal attachment to. So this shows us that God loves his son, which is himself, but he loves mankind more than he loves himself to the point that he willingly sacrificed himself in human form in order to restore his relationship with mankind. It's in the same way that Abraham loved his son Isaac, but Abraham loved God more to the point that he was willing to sacrifice Isaac in order to maintain his relationship, his covenant relationship with God. Mm. Hallelujah. Let's continue. Go back to John chapter 5, verse 20. God bless you, brother Reuben. Welcome. Verse 20. Jesus said, For the Father loveth the Son, and showeth the Son all things that the Father himself doeth. And the Father will show the Son greater works than these that you marvel. For as the Father raised up the dead and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. Hmm. Now, Jesus just gave us a preview of what he would do later in his public ministry. Not only the restoration of Lazarus and Jairus' daughter from death, but his own resurrection from death to eternal life. Verse 22. For the Father judgeth no man, but has committed all judgment unto the Son. Mm. Now, this word judges, it's a form of the Greek word krino, which means to make a separation or a selection. To pick this one from amongst the group. So the father does not select the individuals who will spend eternity in the kingdom of God. That selection comes through the Son and is granted to those who willingly believe the gospel. And it's in this way that Jesus will build his church. Hold that place there in John chapter 5. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 11. We're going to read verse 27. Hallelujah. Jesus said, all things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father. Neither knoweth any man the Father, save or except the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal the Father. Hmm. So God dispenses grace, an undeserved gift, to everyone, enabling us the capacity to believe the gospel of Christ and be given the promise of salvation. The Father draws those who then choose to believe the gospel to Christ. Christ then restores that fellowship with the Father, and reveals the Father to that person that now believes the gospel. This is confirmed in John chapter 5. Let's go back to John chapter 5, verse 23. Jesus said, The purpose of the Father not selecting who believes the gospel 
is so, verse 23, that all men should honor the Son even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son honoreth not the Father which has sent him. So this means that a person cannot honor the Father yet reject Jesus. Hmm. I recall in a church that I used to go to, someone was praying and said, we want you, Father. We don't want Jesus. We don't want the Holy Spirit. We want you. And of course, I had to open my eyes and look at this person because it's obvious that she did not know what it was that she was saying. She had no concept of who God was. Even though she was praying, maybe her heart was in the right place, but she obviously did not know what she was talking about. Hmm. Continuing verse 24. Jesus said, verily, verily, I say unto you, truly, the person that heareth my word, and the word he's talking about is the gospel, and as a result, believeth on the Father that sent me, has everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. And this is a truth that was repeated from John chapter 3, verse 18. He that believeth on Christ and his message is not condemned, but he that believeth not in Christ and his message of the gospel is condemned already. And why is that? Because he has not believed the name of the only begotten Son of God. Mm. Let's continue John chapter 5, verse 25. Hallelujah. Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you that the hour is coming and now is when the dead, and that's those that are separated from God by sin, shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. Hmm. Paul talks about this in Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to read verses 1 through 5, and I'll be reading from the God's Word translation. Paul tells the Ephesians, which were Gentile or non-Jewish believers of Christ, and I guess some Jewish converts to Christianity amongst them as well. He says to them in verse one, you were once dead and this is dead to God. And he tells them why? Because of your failures and sins. You followed the ways of this present world and its spiritual ruler. And that spiritual ruler is none other than Lucifer called the God of this world. This ruler continues to work in people who refuse to obey God. All of us once lived among these people and followed the desires of our corrupt nature. We did what our corrupt desires and thoughts wanted us to do. So because of our nature, we deserved God's anger just like everyone else. Verse 4, But God is rich in mercy because of his great love for us. We were dead because of our failures, but he made us alive together with Christ. It's God's kindness that saved you, and that kindness was manifested through the free an undeserved gift of grace called regeneration. What scripture also refers to as being born again. Now there's more proof of the harmony of scriptures. Peter also gives this same thought in his epistle. Let's turn to 1 Peter chapter 4. I'm going to read verses 4 through 6. Again, I'll be reading from the God's Word translation. Peter says in verse 4, 
unbelievers insult you now because they surprised that you no longer join them in the same excesses of wild living. They will give an account to the one who is ready to judge the living and the dead. After all, the good news was told to people like that, although they are now dead. It was told to them so that they could be judged like humans in their earthly lives and live like God in their spiritual lives. Mm. So let's go back to John chapter 5, verses 26 and 27. Jesus says, For as the Father has life in himself, so has the Father given to the Son to have life in himself. Hmm. Now you may recall what we read in John chapter 1, verse 4, that in the Word or the Logos of God was eternal life, and that eternal life was the light or the spiritual illumination of men. Hmm. Verse 27. The, the, the Father has given the Son to have life in himself and has given the Son authority to execute judgment also because the Son is the Son of Man. What does all of that mean? Well, this refers to Jesus' humanity, which means that as a man, Jesus has the capacity to understand how man thinks and feels, having firsthand experience of this human condition, this being subject to emotions that are not under control, being deceived by lies that are also affected by our emotions. He has firsthand knowledge of all of that. He knows how it feels, not by a, a textbook knowledge because God is omniscient and knows everything, but Jesus himself knows by virtue of experience. And this makes him qualified to judge the actions of people. And while also being God, makes him qualified to judge their motives for their actions. So Jesus can judge why people did a certain thing and judge the action that they committed also. Mm. See, that's the difference between us and Jesus. You see, we have a tendency not only to judge actions that we witness with our own eyes, but then we jump to conclusions and form the reason in our minds, the motive that that person had when they did what they did, when there's no way that we could know that. The only two people in existence that would know why a person did a certain thing is that person themselves and Jesus, God. This is the reason why we're not to judge unrighteously. We can't say, you did this because you think or because you feel X, Y, Z, because we don't know. Only that person knows, and Jesus. We're unqualified to judge their motives, but we are qualified to judge actions that are in direct contradiction to the Word of God, not motives. Hallelujah. So let's go back to verse to John chapter 5, verse 28. Hallelujah. Jesus continues and says, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves... So here he's not talking about those that are just spiritually dead, but he's also talking about those that are physically dead. Shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good and believe the gospel, that's what that being good means, unto the resurrection of life. 
and they that have done evil, which is the opposite of good, so that means rejecting the gospel, unto the resurrection of damnation. Hmm. Hallelujah. Let's, you know, let, let's just look at this a little bit more. The resurrection of damnation. That is just so important. I just don't want to skim over it. Amen. We know that resurrection is not the same as restoration to life. That's what Lazarus and Jairus' daughter experienced. Resurrection to their chronological lives from death, which means their lives continued as if they never died, but eventually they died. Here, Jesus is talking about resurrection, which is resurrection from death to eternal life. Big difference. It's not back to physical life, but to eternal life. But here he says there's a resurrection of damnation. So that means it's a, rest it's a, it's a resurrection to eternal life in a state of damnation. That's those who will be cast into the lake of fire, which symbolizes the eternal separation from the presence of God. Eternal. So that means those that experience it have been resurrected, but now that is the fate that they're going to face. So this tells us that everybody, dead or alive, will be resurrected and some, probably most, for the purpose of judgment. There will be some who will be rewarded with eternal life in the kingdom of God. While those that are resurrected, the evil people, let's say Adolf Hitler, will be resurrected for the purpose of judgment, to experience eternal damnation. So what Jesus is talking about right here in verse 29 is a veiled description of the white throne judgment and the lake of fire, which you can read about in Revelation chapter 20. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's go back and finish that out. We're in John chapter 5, verse 30, trying to find my place here. Jesus said, I can of mine own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge. Who is he hearing? He's hearing from the Father. The Father who conceives. Jesus embodies it. So as I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just because I seek not mine own will. In other words, he's not judging according to his own personal standards as a human being, but the will of the Father, which has sent me. So Jesus judges by the standards of God. And this is the way that he admonishes us to judge one another, not by personal standards, not by church tradition, not by family tradition, not by personal opinions or the opinions of society, but by the standards of God. Hmm. Verse 31, he says, if I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. And this is because the logos, again, which is God's thoughts and ideas and concepts, originates with the Father. Thoughts are not the evidence of self-creation. Thoughts are evidence of creation by the person conceiving the thoughts. This is why the Father or the, the, the aspect of God referred to as the Father is the conceiving, creating part of God. Mm. Likewise, Christ, again being God the Son and the human embodiment of God's thoughts, is evidence of God the Father conceiving these thoughts. Mm. 
Let's continue verse 32. Hallelujah. John chapter 5, verse 32. Jesus said, There is another that bears witness of me. Now, who is this witness? I mean, immediately we might jump the gun and say it's the Holy Spirit, but it's not. Hold that place there. Let's turn to Isaiah chapter 42, verses 1 and 2. Isaiah said, and is speaking as God's oracle, he says, Behold my servant, whom I uphold, mine elect, in whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit, this is God talking, so it's talking about the Holy Spirit, upon him. See, not in him, but upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. Verse 2, my servant shall not cry, nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. Hmm. So now let's go back to John chapter 5, verse 32. Jesus is speaking. He said, there's one that testifies or witnesses of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesses of me is true. So this witness is none other than John the Baptist. Hmm. Hallelujah. Verse 33, and of course, uh, verse 33, yes. Ye sent unto John the Baptist, and he bear witness unto the truth. That confirms that this witness that Jesus is talking about is not the Holy Spirit, but it's John the Baptist. And as John the Baptist was the forerunner of Christ, identifying him and announcing his arrival, Christ is the forerunner of the Holy Spirit, announcing his arrival. Hmm. Verse 34, But I receive not testimony from man, but these things I say that you might be saved. He, referring to John the Baptist, was a burning and a shining light, and ye were willing for a season to rejoice in his light. That was already back in John chapter 1. Let's turn back there and take a quick look at that. John chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. Scripture tells us there was a man sent from God whose name was John the Baptist. The same John the Baptist came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. John the Baptist was not that light, but he was sent to bear witness of that light. So John the Baptist was sent by God to declare the truth about Christ on earth so that everyone would become believers through the message that Christ would bring. And verse 9, that Jesus Christ was the true light which lighteth or gives God's truth and knowledge to every man that cometh in the world. Hmm. Now the proof that everyone receives regeneration from God is seen in those two words. Every man. Jesus gives God's truth and knowledge to every man that is born into human society. The problem is that despite being given this truth of God, not everyone chooses of their own free will to believe it. And that is what Jesus says triggers the condemnation, that light is coming into this world, but men reject that light because they prefer darkness. Mm. Let's continue. John chapter 5, verse 36. Hallelujah. Here Jesus continues in verse 36. But I have greater witness than that of John the Baptist. 
for the works which the Father has given me to finish, the same works that I do, bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. Now notice what Jesus says, the works that God gave him to finish. This shows us, because John the Baptist was the forerunner to Christ, this shows us that John the Baptist was given the job by the Father to start the process of man's salvation, and Jesus was given the job of finishing it. This is just what he just said. So this answers a tough question regarding Christ's final statement on the cross. And we are approaching that time of the year. Some people still call it Easter, but that's a pagan holiday. It's Passover, and in the church we call that Resurrection Sunday. Amen? That time of the year is approaching when many churches will have their services, the seven last words of Christ. And one of those last words that he uttered while he were on the cross was on the cross is, it is finished. That was in John 19, verse 30. Jesus said, it's finished, and then he bowed his head and he gave up the ghost. So the question is, what was finished? What was the job that the Father gave Christ to come to earth to complete, to finish? And while he was on the cross, he said, it is finished. Well, that job, which was started by John the Baptist, that the Father gave Christ to finish, was the process of man's reconciliation with God and being given the promise of salvation. By being the sacrifice that satisfied the Mosaic law, Christ moved it out of the way, as, jo as Paul says in Galatians, and what was an impediment to man's free relationship with God was now able to be restored. And Christ restored it by satisfying the requirement of death that the law demanded. Once he satisfied that requirement, the law was no longer in effect. Paul tells us in Galatians chapter 3 also that the law was only temporary. It had an expiration date. And that expiration date was when the person whom the law spoke of arrived. Jesus told the Pharisees, you, you believe in the law and you believe in the law that you have eternal life. But truly I say unto you that the words in the law, they speak of me. He's talking about himself. So once Christ died, the law was satisfied and that, um, we could say that the law was actually a rider or an appendix that was added on to the Abrahamic covenant. Once that was satisfied, it is now obsolete and moved out of the way, has no legal binding force at all. Now, let's not be confused about this because we're talking about the ceremonial aspect of the law, the sacrifices and the rituals all done away with. The moral aspect of goodness that the law speaks of are still in effect and encapsulated in this new commandment that Christ gives us in that we are to love one another, not like the law says, you know, as we love ourselves, but to love one another in the same way that God loves us, which is elevating the status of love from phileo to agape, a higher standard, a higher quality of love. And if we love each other the way that God loves us, all the things, the behavioral aspects that the law outlines that should not be done and the consequences for them, they're all encapsulated right there in that one commandment to love one another as God loves us. Because if we do, we wouldn't do those things. Hallelujah. 
So it's the ceremonial and the sacrificial and the ritual aspects of the law have been satisfied and moved out of the way. No longer in effect, no longer binding. Amen. If anybody has a house with a mortgage, you get to stay in the house as long as you keep paying your mortgage. Once that mortgage is finished being paid, you own the house. You no longer have to keep making a mortgage payment every month. But saying that we are still under the law or aspects of the law are still binding on us now in this dispensation of grace is the same as saying the mortgage on my house is completely paid off, but I must still keep making those payments every month because I'm afraid what would happen if I don't. That is foolishness. It's not walking in the truth. Hmm. Hallelujah. I don't know who that was for. <laughs> Hallelujah. But let's continue. Let's go on. Let's go back to John chapter 5, verse 37. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <clears throat> John chapter 5, verse 37. Jesus continues and he says, And the Father himself, which has sent me, has borne witness of me. Ye have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape. And you have not the Father's word abiding in you. For whom the Father hath sent, which was Christ, him you believe not. Search the scriptures. Here we go, just what I just finished quoting. For in them ye think you have eternal life. And they are they which testify of me. And that's in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 17 through 19. Verse 40. And you will not come to me that you might have eternal life. Verse 41. I receive not honor from men. But I know you, that you have not the love of God in you. I am come in my Father's name, or my Father's authority, and you receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him you will receive. How can you believe, which receive honor one of another, in other words, because you love the praise of men, and seek not the honor that cometh from God only? Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. And here's the reason why. There is one that accuses you. And that's Lucifer using the Mosaic law in his function as the devil, making accusations. Mm. Even Moses in whom you trust. See, it wasn't Moses that was accusing anyone through the law. It was Lucifer using the law that Moses delivered to the people. It's like a rule book. Basically, these are the rules. It's your responsibility to know the rules. If you break the rules, I will accuse you of breaking the rules and there will be consequences to pay. And I will open up this rule book and I will show you the rule that you broke. So this is what Jesus is talking about. Not Moses accusing them, but Lucifer using the Mosaic law that Moses delivered unto the people. So Jesus is telling these people that even though they trusted in Moses, and looked at him as a supreme human authority, and he was, Moses was nonetheless a fallible human being, just like them. Though he placed supreme, uh, though they placed, I should say, supreme authority in the Mosaic law, the law was only to reveal the sin of man and what man could do to get back in right standing with God, even though it was only temporary. So the law identified their actions and their behavior as being contrary to the right standards of God. And Lucifer used this 
as ammunition to accuse them before God and trigger the death penalty for sin. Hallelujah. It really is so simple when we look at it from that particular point of view. Fortunately, on the cross, Christ satisfied the requirements and that rule book is thrown out and has been superseded with another rule that makes it so simple. Love each other the way that God loves us. Mm. Jesus, as he said, did not come to accuse anybody before God. Yet the Jews in general gave Jesus no honor as the messenger whom God sent with the best news that anyone could ever imagine. And that news was the possibility of right standing with God without the excessive demands of the Mosaic law. And what is so sad is that people today are still trying to revert to being under the law, which cannot provide eternal life, but only points out the sin of man, which leads to death. So why would we, why would anybody in their right mind would want to place themselves back under a no-win situation when we've already been delivered from that no-win situation? All we got to do is have faith that Jesus paid the price. It's done. It's over with. All we have to do is stay the course. And when Jesus returns, he's going to make good on his promise of eternal salvation. This is what we're waiting for. All of these things that the law demanded, we are under no obligation to do. Let's finish this off for this evening. Back to John chapter 5, verse 46 and 47. Jesus said, For had ye believed Moses, if you believed the law that Moses delivered from God to you, you would have believed me. For Moses wrote of me. This is in Deuteronomy 18, again, regarding the prophet whom God will rise up or raise up, I should say, out of Israel. Verse 47, but if you believe not Moses' writings, how shall you believe my words? You have absolutely nothing to validate those words with. So God not only gave them a rule book, but he also gave them a way to identify the Messiah when he arrived. Therefore, not only did they not believe Jesus, but they didn't even believe the law that they claimed to be following, that they claimed to be the supreme authority over all the land. They, they weren't even following that. This is the reason why when Paul set up the Gentile churches outside of Jerusalem, they said, listen, why should we make them follow the law when we and our ancestors couldn't follow it either? So why should we put that burden on them? Right there in the book of Acts. Hmm. Hallelujah. So this is a testament as to the healing process that God began with John the Baptist, finished through Jesus Christ. And it's not just physical healing, even though Jesus did uh, perform a lot of physical healings. It's the healing of our relationship with God. God is calling us home calling us back to him. And he's making it so easy. Just believe the gospel. That's all you got to do. Just believe the gospel. Now, the thing is, if, if there was a room full of a billion dollars in cash and somebody opened up that door and said, you see all of that money? 
It's all yours. Just walk into the room, get it, claim it. It's yours. How many people would dash into that room without a second thought? Well, it's the same concept. God is saying, I'm inviting you to spend all eternity in my kingdom with me, the kingdom of God. No more sadness, no more sickness, no more hate, no more anger, no more pain, no more sorrow. It's a paradise. All you have to do is believe that what I just told you is true. And you can come. Why is it then that people still will not believe it? Well, Paul answers that question. The God of this world, who was Lucifer, has blinded their eyes, lest spiritually perceiving the truth, they would choose to believe it and be saved. And this is the reason for regeneration in the first place, to level the playing field so that we are capable now of perceiving the kingdom of God and making an informed choice whether or not to believe it. Now, after having experienced regeneration, I don't know why anybody would not want to believe it, but that's their choice. But either way, no one can say that they didn't know. Hallelujah. Our relationship with God has been healed, but it's now up to us to draw closer to Him and continuing to draw close to Him to maintain it. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, hallelujah. Hallelujah. We thank you, Father, for this unspeakable gift, Father, that you have given us. Father, that, that many people, Father, just don't recognize, Father, or don't realize, called regeneration. Hallelujah. Enabling us to be able to perceive you and your kingdom and choosing to believe it. And Father, what a glorious eternity awaits those that will believe your gospel. Hallelujah. Father, I pray, Lord, that through this particular teaching tonight, that you would anoint it, Father, that whosoever has joined with us this evening or witnesses or watches this video at any other time, Father, would then choose to believe your words, to believe your kingdom, and to believe that Jesus Christ told us the truth. Hallelujah. And we thank you, Father. I pray that you have been glorified this evening in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and amen and amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, this concludes our Bible study for this evening. If anybody has any questions or comments they'd like to add, please type it in in the comment section. I am going to scroll back and read some of these comments uh, God bless you, my brother Cornell from New York. Amen. He says, I'm here, my brother. I'm ready to be transformed. Hallelujah. Amen. That's an ongoing process that we all need to stay in. Amen. Hallelujah. Brother Reuben says, good evening, my brother. Hallelujah. And Reuben also says that it's so refreshing. Hallelujah. Amen. The truth of the word of God is refreshing. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, if we don't have any more questions or comments, you can still type them in. But for those that may have joined late or are watching this video, amen, you know that it's being recorded. You are probably watching this at a later time, but the word of God is eternal and it's always fresh. Amen. Hallelujah. But if you'd like to watch this video in its entirety, you can do so on Facebook the moment we log off. You can also look at this teaching in its entirety at our website, which uh, I'm going to put the information here. Hallelujah. It is www.transformingwordnyc.org. There's our website right there. You can go there. You can look at this teaching in its entirety, along with all the previous teachings from our current series on the Gospel of John and all of our previous series, the Letters to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, uh, 
church cliches, parables of Christ. Amen. They're all there. Amen. All you have to do is just visit the site. It's there. Absolutely free. Freely we've been given. Freely we do give because there's no copyright and there's no price for the word of God. Amen. You can also watch it in its entirety on our YouTube channel. Just put in a search for Transforming Word Ministries. You'll see our logo right there up here. And while you're there, please uh, consider subscribing so that in the event you want to see this teaching at a later time, it may be very difficult to find it and track it down on Facebook, but you'll easily be able to find it on YouTube. All I ask is that you share the link of this teaching or any of the other teachings share the link for our ministry website as well as our youtube website with as many people as you can because it's our goal to edify the body of christ with the time that we have remaining before christ returns amen there are a lot of people that go to church now that still don't know what the word of god says on one hand, I mean, if they recently started coming, you can understand that. But on the other hand, if they've been going to church for 15, 20 years, and they still don't know some of the basics of the word, we can see that the problem is in the lack of teaching. Amen. So if you can assist me in that by sharing this video as many times with as many people as you can, we can accomplish so much more working together than one person can by myself <laughs> and i've been in facebook jail more than enough times to testify about it amen hallelujah amen well if we have no further questions or comments amen i'm going to let everybody go it's about 9 30 right about on time amen hallelujah by god's grace we will be back next tuesday which should be march 9th already it's march hallelujah it seemed like just last week it was december <laughs> But we're now in March, amen, so by, uh, by God's grace, March 9th, which is next Tuesday, 8.30 p.m. Eastern Time, we will be back as we continue our study on the Gospel of John, chapter 6, amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Please invite someone to join with you as we journey through the Word of God, amen. So by God, God willing, we will be back next Tuesday and we will continue this labor of love for the kingdom of God. Amen. So I want to thank all of you. God bless you, Brother Reuben, especially Brother Cornell. Hallelujah. God bless you. And thank you for joining with us this evening. Hallelujah. I know God loves you and, and loves you your attention and your dedication to his word as we are all being transformed by the Holy Spirit into representatives of Christ. Amen. God bless you. I love you all with the love of the Lord. Hallelujah. Remember, as we close for the evening, to prove all things and then hold fast to that which the word of God proves to be true. Hallelujah. Well, this has been Transforming Word Ministries Tuesday Night Bible Study. I have been Apostle, oh, I still am, Apostle Marcos. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. We will see you next time in Jesus' name. And remember, until then, tell somebody that you love them in Jesus' name. Have a blessed evening and a blessed week. We'll see you next time right here. God bless you, everyone. Have a great night.